So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Dharma practice Q&A session. Um, this is part three of the question, what happens to us after we die? It's May 20th, 2020. And as usual, let's start with three bows. So we have the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in front of us. So first bow. Second bow. Third bow. Okay, so how about we do the Dharma request? Repeat with me or um, chant along with me. Will the Sangha with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize number. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sujedoye ulahadi samya sambuddhoje Supreme and wondrous dharma subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. All Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Venerable Master, and all good and wise Dharma friends online, Amitofo, welcome to our Dharma practice Q&A session. We're gonna to continue to investigate these questions that we started three weeks ago. First one, what happens to our relatives and friends when they pass away? Given that right now it's a, it's a tough time with the pandemic, I think many people are facing this question of maybe their loved ones being sick, maybe even passing away. So what happens during this process from the Buddhist perspective? Even more importantly, how can we help them along their journey to their next life? So that's two questions. And of course, one is other people, but you could say even more importantly, or less importantly, depending on who you are, what happens to us when we die? And how do we prepare ourselves for when that moment comes? This was, you could say, the key question that launched the Buddha on his quest for awakening. He saw that all living beings passed away and he wanted to find a solution to this. So this question is at the heart of the Buddha Dharma. So just a quick recap of part one and two. I think um, it's, not, it's not bad to review this because these Dharma principles are very deep. So number one, by under understanding death, we understand how to live. So this is actually quite important. If we have a bigger picture of what happens to us from life to life to life, then that gives us more understanding of how to live our life right now. A couple more principles that I think don't only apply at the end of life, but all the time. The first one is don't fight with other people. Be harmonious, kind, and patient. Respect other people's beliefs. Don't force our beliefs on others. We don't want to touch the body for at least eight hours after the person dies. We can recite. We don't want to get too emotional and cry. Let the person go peacefully. We can recite. We can transfer our care to the other person by reciting Namo Amitofo. Reciting is a good way to transform our grief. And we also went over um, these principles as given by Great Master Inguang and Venerable Master Hong Yi, or Vinaya Master Hong Yi. And I just sent that link out in the chat box if people wanted to, to go to it and download and read those articles yourself. So this is what we went over in the past. And as promised, I was going to continue with the story about my family friend who passed away. So where we got to in the story was 
um, the family friend, which I called Amy, actually uh, died. And I was driven home by her aunt, who was initially very skeptical. But when she drove me home, she said to me, you know what? I don't know what happened, but my brother's daughter just died. And he actually seems peaceful and happy. You know, I'm not sure what happened there. And essentially we recited for um, Amy as she passed away. And her father especially was extremely sincere. And in my observation really did let go and wanted the best for his daughter. Although I would say he's not really Buddhist Buddhist. You know, he's maybe culturally Chinese, but he has of course a deep care for his daughter. So he used the Dharma method of letting go and reciting the Buddha's name. And somehow, you know, something happened and it kind of turned. However, this story continues because after I got some rest, what happened? Well, essentially, I, I timed this, I, or I titled this Funeral Service, Traditional Buddhism Meets Modern America. So my mom came to speak with me. So I just kind of got out of bed. I was a little bit tired. My mom looked at me really stressed. I said, what's wrong? She said, I couldn't sleep all, at all last night because uh, there's differing views. There's a kind of a different differing opinions about what to do for the funeral service. So one was a monk who had come to help with, the, um, with Amy when she passed away. He kind of told her you know, she's, she passed away, not to cling to her body, to let go. And so she, since she came to, this, to her death and knew that she was passing, he was um, quite firm that we needed to do a Buddhist ceremony for her, Rufa which is according to the Dharma in a proper way. We need to do a proper funeral service for Amy. So that's one view. Now the other view was Amy's family and friends, many who weren't Buddhist, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, Saratoga. Now, I know uh, maybe a little bit more Buddhist now, but when I grew up, uh, very few Buddhists. Uh, and when somebody passes away, you know, the young person, what do we want to do? We want to celebrate her life. We want to sing songs, share reflections about how that person was very meaningful to us, made a difference in our lives. Maybe have a slideshow of, you know, the things that they've done in their lives. So these two differing ideas for the funeral service. And so my mom was talking to me saying, maybe I could talk to the monk and explain to him about American culture and kind of convince him you know, maybe we could do the celebration because her friends and family really wanted that. And since I was kind of the, I was a strange one in the family, you know, I got really into Buddhism. And so I knew the Buddhist monastic lingo. So maybe I could convince this Buddhist monk. Now this Buddhist monk wasn't a DRBA monk. It wasn't another organization. Um, but I was kind of asked by my mom to go talk with this monk. So I thought to myself, wow, uh, okay, this is an interesting interesting situation. So I think about a little bit and talk with my mom and I think to myself, okay, so maybe what's the best thing to do to tell the monk is we really want to let the family and friends celebrate the life of Amy. This is their way of showing their care and support for her. And we don't want to force a Buddhist ceremony on these other people because that could actually foster resentment instead, which is not good for Buddhism. Um, I actually remembered a story when I had a friend pass away um, after he was in a coma for quite a while. He's a Christian. And me and my friends went to his funeral. And during the service for um, my friend, the minister took this opportunity to try to convert everyone. I, I put the person's name as Jason, although the person's name wasn't Jason. Um, but he basically says something like, you know what, if you want to see Jason again, in heaven, you have to believe in Jesus. Otherwise, you'll never see Jason again. Now, when he said this, you know, I could see me, I looked at my other friends and we could all go, hmm, that wasn't very skillful. And after the, the service, you know, we, we kind of talked with the family, we kind of, you know, in the Christian church, we kind of did a little small talk, 
And when we left, we all commented to each other, wow, we thought that minister was really out of line there to kind of say those things because it was kind of aggressive, basically saying, you know, if you really care about our friend Jason and you want to see him again, well, you have to believe in Jesus. I was taking this moment where, you know, people are bringing forward their heart of care and have a sense of pain and vulnerability and capitalizing on converting people to your faith, you know, it would left a bad flavor in our mouth. So the sense was, well, we don't, you know, I didn't want that experience for, you know, Amy's friends, but within a Buddhist context. So I thought was maybe we could do a Buddhist ceremony separately, maybe at a different day, a different time, maybe in the monastery, you know, not, 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 at the, not for the funeral service, right? So this is our plan. We're going, okay, we're going to go in and convince the monk that, okay, we're going to have this plan. Let, let, let the friends do their funeral service, their memorial service. Okay, so when we start meeting with a monk, you know, we, of course, respectfully, we have the monk speak first. So he started sharing. First, he actually said he felt my mom was a, a kind of a out, upstanding member of our, of our community. So he says, uh, you guys should do it correctly because if you do it correctly, then other people can learn. If you don't do it correctly, then other people aren't gonna learn. So that's how he started. Then he explained to us this process of rebirth, which I actually found quite interesting because it was one of the most thorough explanations I ever gotten. So he first said, Amy's now in a spirit state in between bodies. And he described that she's able to travel instantaneously by thought. She thinks of her mom, she maybe visits her mom. She thinks of her home, she visits her home. He says, this is similar to our experience of meditation where our mind goes everywhere and Amy is facing this instability. He commented that meditation is a good preparation for dying because of this very point, that when we're dying or we're dead and we're in between states, the stability of our mind that we've cultivated throughout our lives helps us stay stable to go to our next life. He also said that she could see what's going on in people's minds if they're sincere or not, if they're lying or not, if they're concentrated or not, that she was no longer limited to language. She could actually see the thoughts behind the words that people were saying and not limited by the physical body. And lastly, he said that this time between death and her next life is very important because it determines the realm of her next rebirth. And this process usually takes 49 days, although this is not fixed. So for this, I wanted to actually share a um, a video from I, I've 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 kind of shown this before. So please tell me if you can uh, let me turn on the video. Uh, optimize forge. So please write in the chat box if you can't see the the video properly. So this is a interview of people who have near death experiences. This uh, woman died and came back. Last time we saw, she said that. She came back because her family members needed her back, so she chose to come back. Now we get a chance to hear her um, her experiences. Let me just double check here. Um, traveling instantaneously by thought. I thought it was quite interesting to hear her talk about it directly. Okay, so tell me if you can't hear it. Uh, of people out in the hall, the room had been sealed off because he was going to do surgery in the room. So I immediately went out through the door, did not open it, just went out. I was immediately on the other side of the, in the hall. But I go up to my daughter and I try to make her hear me. Kathy, go home and change her clothes. I couldn't make her hear me, so I went to her dad. I said, Judd, take Kathy home, change her clothes. She should be out like this. While they were in the hall, um, and I was trying to send them home, a brother of my husband's came up and he was talking to him and he had gotten worried to come. And one of his neighbors had, was also in the hospital and he came up and started talking to my brother-in-law, wanting to know what he was doing at the hospital and what he was going to do that weekend. He said, well, it looks like my sister-in-law is going to kick the bucket. And I was planning to go to Athens, but I'll stick around now. So just a note. So she's the sister-in-law, right? So he was talking about her 
that she died. Kick the bucket means died. To be a pallbearer. Later, I was also able to talk to him. He did want to admit it, but he did admit this is what he had said. And I laughed at him because it embarrassed him. It was amazing that I, I, I was never leaving my body too. I was everywhere who thought about me, but I was with my body. It means that I, I was not leaving the one part for another. I was everywhere at the same time. I could be in New York, I could be in Longview, Texas. I could be uh, in uh, Moscow, I could be in, in Tbilisi, Georgia. In any place, there was no distance and time at that time with me. And this time, I'm thinking, I want to see my sister. So I immediately find myself in Rockville, Maryland, at her home. And she's getting ready to go grocery shopping. She's wearing a beige suit with the green blouse. She's had to go over the house and look for her keys that she had misplaced, had to find her grocery list. And finally, she walks out her front door to get in her blue Monte Carlo Chevrolet. And I feel there's no need for me to go to the grocery store with her, so I let her go on. And I'm going to pop over then to another sister who lives a few miles away from her. And this other sister had already left home. I was able to determine she had gone grocery shopping herself. So the guides asked me, was I ready to leave this area now? And I agreed, said yes. About two weeks after I had this near-death experience, I was in contact with my sisters and I brought this fact up to her and described and she said, well, how did you know? I didn't see you, you weren't here. I could communicate with the children, with very little children who couldn't speak and who couldn't walk and who were very little and just coming from that place where I was going. And this was amazing communication with them, uh, spiritual communication. We, we never spoke in words. We spoke in, in uh, mental communication. And uh, she had broken hip and nobody understood why she was crying so loud. And uh, the doctors and his parents were very concerned about this. And I said, don't cry anyway. Nobody will understand why do you cry. And she, she stopped crying and she uh, smiled, you know. And, and it was incredible experience for that people who were around. And they looked at her and said, what's happened? Why she's not crying at this time? I want to tell them that, you know, she has this disease. This happened with her but I couldn't communicate with them. After the third day when I was um, back to my body and after three days when I could speak, I said to them that, you know, your daughter is uh, crying because of this. She has a broken hip and, you know, and uh, this is the diagnosis which you are seeking on, you know, and they, they found that it was truth, you know. They were shocked and they were surprised. I've also wondered Okay, so, so that's what I wanted to share. So you, from that, I think there's two things that we can kind of see from there. One is the idea of traveling around by thought, and the other one about being able to communicate with people uh, kind of mind to mind or see what's going on in people's minds. So that's kind of interesting. I can share one quick experience. I was actually helping out in something called spiritual care at Stanford Hospital when I was an undergrad. And we visited different people in the hospital. And I remember one time I visited somebody, um, not Buddhist. What they do is actually they, they classify your visits by language. And because, you know, if you can speak another language, then you can at least communicate with the person. And so this person was a Chinese person. And I remember visiting um, him. And it was really kind of interesting because when I walked into the room, he was literally ecstatic. And his wife was there too. I had one of my friends with me. Um, and we were visiting him and he was ecstatic. <laughs> and and well, what, after he's talked to us for a little bit, we realized that he had just woken up from a kind of a, a coma for quite a while that the doctors thought he was going to die from. And he says, the doctors are about to come, you know, they're, they're actually on their way over because they're just amazed that he's come back to life. 
And he started sharing all of the experiences he had just traveling around outside of his body. He says, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in the Buddha. It was interesting because he didn't actually have like a religious category to put what he experienced in. But he said he was traveling all over and saw all these different kinds of beings. And he met like Buddha, God, Jesus, you know, <laughs> a great spirit. It doesn't. So that was just one, one experience I had directly with somebody who had um, come back. I don't know if you could say he didn't actually die, but he was definitely in between uh, realms. Okay, so, so I asked the question at this time of the monk. I said, so how was the next rebirth decided during these 49 days? His response to me was that whatever thoughts she had during this time period determines where she will be reborn. Right now, she's going to remember all of the things she did in this life and perhaps also in past lives. And depending on her thoughts, either positive or negative, she un ends up in the corresponding rebirth, maybe in the hells or the hungry ghost realm, the animals, humans, Ashura or Deva realms. This could be another um, Dharma practice Q&A session if people are interested about what are those different realms that I just listed there. But then he went on, if she thinks, uh, or get, if she gets angry, scared, worried, frustrated, and so forth, she goes to the lower realms. If she is peaceful, happy, then she goes to the higher realms. Her, lot, her thoughts solidify her into the form, which she will then take on in the next rebirth. He went on to say this process usually takes 49 days. And that's why family and friends are encouraged to recite on her behalf to dedicate the gongda, the merit, for her and clear away her yezang, her karmic obstacles. I asked him, what are karmic obstacles? He said, karma obstacles can be the things that people can't let go of in this life, their money, their family, their relationships, and so forth. Or perhaps debt collectors, yuan qing zaizu, people or beings that the deceased person owes something to. As an example, let's say we ate a lot of meat in this life. Uh, so sometimes um, those beings that we've eaten, they want to come and collect that. Um, and the moment when we die is a chance that they can kind of pull our energy away with them. So then he went on. He said, what the person sees at this time is not fixed because it's based on that person's relationships, their karma, their belief system. So some people might see gods and angels, some people see their family and friends, or others just see emptiness. If you watch that movie, Life After Life by Raymond Moody, you'll see that um, none of them are Buddhist. I mean, it's interesting that, to observe that from a Buddhist lens because um, they're describing their experience without any reference to Buddhism. And many of them see God or see kind of a spirit or like an angel, because that's, you know, in the West, how we understand um, the, the afterlife or, or what happens after we die. It's, it's informed heavily by Christian, Christian faith. So the monk's conclusion was, clearly, we should do the Buddhist funeral service and not dwell on emotions because that's the best thing for Amy. And this is a really good time for Amy's family and friends to learn Buddhism. He even said, you know, that's a good time for them to become Buddhist. There's a lot of merit and virtue in that. And would help Amy on her journey. And of course, I had my alarm bells ringing. Like, I don't want to have a repeat of what I experienced with, like, in a Christian, like, with my Christian friend. So then we gave our idea about having a separate service. We said how important it was for Amy's friends to share about how much Amy had meant to them. You know, Amy had touched many people's lives. So we, we discussed a little while, and we actually came up with a solution, which worked out quite well. So the plan was, we'd have a funeral service. The first half was going to be a Buddhist ceremony. And the attendance of family and friends is optional. We can let people know, you can come at this time, there'll be a Buddhist ceremony, and you can join along and, and recite on behalf of Amy, but it's optional, you don't have to come. Then the second half of the ceremony or the service was a chance for her family and friends to celebrate Amy's life. And this time, all the monastics actually left, <laughs> you know, so since they were there for the service, for the, for the ceremony. 
And so what happened was the service actually went quite well. Uh, many of Amy's family and friends came for the first part of the ceremony, but it wasn't uh, forced on them. And I think that, that, um, that made all the difference. You know, I think in, the, in America with this idea of freedom of religion, that people are free to believe that you want to give people the space to choose if they want to participate in a kind of religious service and not force it on them. So this actually ended up working out quite well. So I wanted to share a couple sutra, sutra passages so people can see that this, these teachings actually come from the sutras. This is the Earth Store Sutra, the chapter seven, benefiting the living and the dead. So if you go to page 45, I'm just going to read this section. I'm going to put my palms together. You can do so if you wish. Suppose the evil karma created by beings were such that they should fall into the bad destinies. If their relatives cultivate wholesome causes on their behalf when they are close to death, then their manifold offenses can be dissolved. If relatives can further do many good deeds during the first 49 days after the death of such beings, then the deceased can leave the evil destinies forever, be born as humans or gods, and receive supremely wonderful bliss. The surviving relatives will also receive limitless benefits. Therefore, before the Buddhas, world honor ones, as well as before the gods, dragon, and the rest of the Eightfold Division, humans and non-humans, I now exhort beings of Jambu Vipa, that's our world, Jambu Vipa, to be careful to avoid harming, killing, and doing other unwholesome deeds, to refrain from worshiping ghosts and spirits or making sacrifices to them, and to never call them mountain sprites on the day of death. Why is that? Killing, harming, and making sacrifices are not the least bit helpful to the deceased. Such acts only bind up the conditions of offenses, so they grow ever more deep and heavy. The deceased might have been due to increase his potential, or her potential, for sagehood, or gain birth among humans or gods in his next life, or in the future. But when his family commits offenses in his name, his good rebirth will be delayed. How much more would that be the case for people on the verge of death, who during their lives have planted few good roots? Each offender has to undergo the bad destinies according to his or her own karma. How could anyone bear to have their relatives add to that karma? That would be like having a neighbor add a few more things to a load over a hundred pounds being carried by someone who has already traveled a long distance, who have not eaten for three days. By adding that extra weight, that person's burden will become even more unbearable. World Honor One, I see that beings of Jambu Vipa will themselves receive the benefit of any good deeds they are able to do within the Buddhist teachings. That holds true even when the deeds are as small as a strand of hair, a drop of water, a grain of sand, or a mote of dust. So this is saying how important it is for our families and friends to help those who are deceased for the first 49 days and not to do things that would add to their karmic offenses. For instance, eating meat or having a big party and, and people are drinking meat and alcohol. You know, that doesn't help the person in their process to the next life. Rather, we can make a vow. You know, I'm gonna tr be vegetarian for 49 days and transfer the goodness of all the lives that are not killed on to their you know, well, their good rebirth. Okay, so another section. The arrival of the great ghost of impermanence. That's essentially death. You know, when we die, it's really unexpected. It's so unexpected that the deceased one's consciousnesses first roam in darkness and obscurity, unaware of offenses and blessings. We're just really confused when we die. What's going on? You know, the body that we're so used to is no longer our home, and we kind of travel around confused. For 49 days, they're as if deluded or deaf or as if in courts where their karmic retributions are being decided. Once judgment is fixed, rebirths are undergone according to their karma. In the time before rebirth are determined, the deceased suffer thousands, of tens of thousands of concerns. How much more is the case for those who are in to fall into the bad destinies? Throughout 49 days, those whose lives have ended and who have not yet been reborn will be hoping every moment that their immediate relatives will earn blessings 
powerful enough to rescue them. At the end of that time, the deceased will undergo retribution according to their karma. If someone is an offender, he may pass through hundreds of thousands of years without even a day's liberation. If someone's offenses deserve fivefold uninterrupted retribution, he will fall into the great hells and undergo incessant suffering through hundreds of thousands of eons. Okay, it's a little bit scary talking about the hell realms. That's why sometimes people find the Earth Star Sutra a little bit difficult to read. Um, and because I think, well, Buddhism talks about hells and it's not a pleasant topic. Um, but to contextualize it, which I think is, is helpful within the Buddhist tradition, the hells are not a permanent destiny. We go there because we've done things that are unskillful. You know, we've, we've developed a kind of very negative mindset, a way of seeing the world. And so then we go to a place of a tremendous amount of suffering. But the Earth Door Sutra is devoted to Earth Door Bodhisattva, who essentially has made vows to stay in the hells until all living beings are freed from it. So in Buddhism, it's not about wanting to condemn people to hell. There's, there's none of that. It's we're hoping people don't create the conditions and karma where they have to suffer, you know, these really negative states. And in the best of our ability, we try to help people out of it. And Earth Store Bodhisattva is the embodiment of that, going into the hell realms to help living beings. I want to also make a point about this judgment. Um, if people get a chance to watch that video, Life After Life, I, I do recommend it. There's a section in it that talks about uh, judgment. They describe how they actually get a kind of panoramic view of their entire life. And they see all the actions that they did in their life. But they don't just see their own action. They actually see the effects of their actions on those people and it ripples out. And it's interesting because they describe that they just are there just watching their whole life um, pass through in this kind of very quick replay. And their conclusion in the end is that what is the most um, powerful or meaningful um, that really lasts, it says, are these unconditional acts of kindness. These small acts of kindness that are we often overlook, that we don't really um, think so much about, we just naturally do. Those are the things that are these spotlighted in this review of life. And so they come back with this deep commitment to caring for those around them. I think that that's quite interesting. Okay, so I'll do one more passage. This is from the Shurangama Sutra. Um, and if you're interested, there's a new translation by BTTS, which is quite good. And it has not all of Master Hua's commentary, but part of it. Master Hua's commentary you'll see is this section that is in a smaller text. The, uh, the larger text is actually the Sutra text. So it's describing this process of going to a new rebirth. So it says, a point of light is seen to appear. When the light is seen clearly, deluded thoughts arise. Both hatred in response to incompatible points of view and love in response to compatible ways of thinking. The thought of love flows out to the fertilized egg, which is then drawn into the womb. Thus the parents' intercourse leads to attraction of a being with whom they share a common karma. Due to these causes and conditions, the fetus develops, passing through the Kalaka stage, the Arbuda stage, and the stages that follow. These different stages are the different stages of conception, if you look below. So then in Master Hua's commentary goes, when a person comes into being, it is the eighth consciousness which arises first. And when a person dies, the eighth consciousness is the last to leave. The body remains warm until the eighth consciousness leaves it. Then the eighth consciousness continues as the body between existences, also called the body between the five aggregates. This body has the appearance of a person or an animal, or otherwise, depending on what kind of being it belonged to in the life it just completed, as if it had been cast from a mold. No matter how far away from its potential father and mother it may be, it will find them if its karma is bound to theirs. It is surrounded by darkness, but when its future parents have intercourse, it will see a pinpoint of light at that place, and it will be drawn to it like steel to a powerful magnet. This in turn leads to conception. 
that the body between existences is a male who will love the mother and hate the father, who will want to strike his father and steal his mother and have intercourse with her, that the body between existences is female, who will love the father and be jealous of the mother, without one thought of ignorance that enters the womb. Those people are born from love and desire, and they die from love and desire. So this describes how living beings are reborn, that we see this point of light and then we go there. And it's an interesting idea because in America, we usually think about how, you know, my life, my, my birth is not my responsibility. You know, my parents had me. But actually, from the Buddhist perspective, we actually chose our parents. So we actually have a pretty big responsibility for the family that we end up in. So the last thing I wanted to share, and then we, I can try to answer some of the questions that people have typed up, is two case studies on rebirth. Um, and you can look into this more if you wish. Uh, so I'm not sure if everyone here believes in rebirth because it's you know not something I think is common in Western culture. Although I think in their survey, they say one out of four people actually do believe in, in that there's life after death and there might be reincarnation. Um, but I guess how much you can you trust surveys? So the first story I had is Dhamma Ruan. Okay, Dhamma Ruin, who was a Sri Lankan boy who remembers actually being a monk with Venerable Buddha Gosha, who was a fifth century monk, a very famous monk who wrote the Visuddhimagga. This Sri Lankan boy actually began ch chanting Pali suttas on his own at about the age of two. In other words, I saw this maybe age three. So very young, he just started chanting these texts and his family didn't know uh, what it was until some of his family members came back from India and said, I think our son is chanting Pali. And they looked into it and they confirmed that, yes, he's actually chanting these Pali suttas. And what was really striking is that the Pali suttas that he was chanting was different than the Sri Lankan versions of these Pali texts. They seem to have become from an older time. And the style of chanting that he had was quite different as well. So I have a number of links if people are interested in, in reading more about this. It's quite striking. I want to share with you, just to give you a flavor of it, is so here's the sound of him actually chanting. And you can see it has an interesting tune to it. It's got a kind of ancient melody. So we only listen to maybe 30, 45 seconds. Just a Giri Mananda Sutta. Spelled wrong here. It should be S-U-T-T-A. Okay, I won't, I won't keep playing it, but you can look into it yourself. Um, there's a monk named Bhikkhu Anavio who wrote a book called, uh, I think, Rebirth in Early Buddhism. And actually, I was reading it, and he does a detailed analysis of what he chanted. He transcribes it, and he compares it to all the current versions of what we have in the, in the Burmese version, the Thai version, the Sri Lankan version of the Pali Canon. And he shows, you know what? Actually, what he's doing is very interesting because it doesn't exactly match any of these. And so... Uh, I would say, I think actually, if you really look into it, it's a pretty strong case for a rebirth happening. Now, does it happen in every case? People, some people question, well, maybe it only happens in select cases. But for him, I think it'd be hard to really say, well, his parents made it up and he was trying to chant something, you know, something else because what he was chanting doesn't actually exist. And he's chanting at as much as such a young age. The second one, um, is a story that I was when I was researching this for this talk, I found is a person named James Leeninger case. It's an American boy who remembers being a fighter pilot shot down in World War II. ABC does a news report about it. There's a case write-up. Um, I just point the case write-up, you can take a look at it. You know, the writing up what happened. But essentially this young boy uh, remembered being a fighter pilot in World War II and getting shot down and dying. 
and at a, at a very young age started recalling his experiences. His family was very skeptical, but bit by bit, they found that what he was saying was actually accurate. And so it was, um, how I would describe, quite shocking for them. And they actually ended up writing a book called uh, Soul Survivor. Um, so if people are interested, you can look into this as well. Again, I think this case is a pretty strong case for rebirth. It'd be hard to really explain otherwise in this particular case. And this write-up, I thought was something very interesting at the end of the write-up. Because it talks about choosing your own life. He says here, um, one day after raking these together, Bruce told James how happy he was to have him as a son. James replied, this is the son, that's why I picked you. I know you would be a good daddy. Bruce did not understand, that's the father. James continued, when I found you and mommy, I knew you would be good to me. Where did you find us? Hawaii, I found you at the big pink hotel. I found you on the beach. You were eating dinner at night. Bruce was dumbfounded. In 1977, Bruce and Andrew indeed went to Hawaii and stayed at the Royal Hawaii, a pink hotel on Waikiki Beach. On the last evening, they had a moonlit dinner at the beach. Five, five weeks later, Andrea became pregnant with James. So that's just that's an interesting um, example of choosing our next life. Okay. So I just wanted to mention before I start looking at the questions is if people have other questions, please email dharmapractice108 at gmail.com. That way we can gather all the Dharma questions in one place. And also this email goes to both Jing Weishu and myself so that um, in terms of monastic etiquette, it's better to have another monk in kind of communication. That way it's less personal. Okay, so let me, in the time remaining, maybe six, seven minutes, let me go through and look at your questions here. So I already shared the link for Great Master Ying Guang and many of Master Hong Li's texts. I would like to know if you have experienced this before, is it your karma to come back to life again? Is it because it was not time to die? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know about um, why people have near-death experiences. They die and then they come back. Um, I can tell a brief story here. Um, I, I mentioned it during the uh, first session that one of the major reasons I committed to Buddhism um, was because I heard uh, Professor Martin Verhoeven's story. He, he, at one point to us, a group of young adults said, kind of sheepishly, you know, I'm on my second life. And I said, I actually looked at Marty and said, what? You're on your second life? What does that mean? And Marty described how he actually died once in Asia. Um, I won't go to all the details, but essentially he got really sick. He died. He said, when you're dying, you can barely remember, you know, he's tried to recite the great strong mantra, great compassion mantra, then try to recite the Buddha's name. He said, even when you die, it's hard to remember your own name. And then he said he left the body and entered this dark space. And then after some time, he could hear these other voices in the background talking to each other. He wasn't sure what was going on. Uh, and so that passed for some time and all of a sudden he woke up and he saw Master Hua there with Reverend Hong Shur looking at him, Reverend Hong Shur looking very scared and Master Hua was doing some kind of mantra and mudras. And, and once he came back to life, he looked at Master Hua, uh, Master Hua told Reverend Hong Shur, tell, tell Marty to come see me tomorrow. Because Marty couldn't speak Chinese, Reverend Hong Shur was his interpreter. So they both go to see Master Hua and Master Hua basically tells him, you know, yesterday you died and I had to go talk to King Yama for you. King Yama is the Lord of the underworld in the Buddhist kind of tradition. And he said, it's not easy talking to King Yama. He has a face like iron steel. But I told King Yama that you still have some more work to do for me in this life. So he let you go. So he says, so you, you got to get serious in your cultivation. <laughs> End of conversation. So that's, that's one story. Now, I don't know if you can universalize that in terms of um, people being their time to die. From the stories of the near-death experience interviews, many of them came back because their loved ones could not let them go. And so they chose to come back. So I mean, I think everybody's got a different condition. Okay, another person says, 
The guy mentioned he was everywhere, New York, Georgia. Is this the Dharma body encompassing everywhere? If I remember correctly, the great master mentioned Ying body. I know that some Theravada venerables still eat meat from the offering. Did that involve karmic debt too? If so, in the Thai tradition, there are monks who eat meat yet realize arhatship. What is the explanation for this? Uh, I wouldn't probably say that his experience is the Dharma body, because Dharma body is actually, you realize that when you become fully awakened. I don't know exactly what he was describing because I wasn't experiencing it. But what it sounded like was that he could travel anywhere by thought. Um, that, that to me is kind of, I can, I can kind of see. Now, does that mean he's actually everywhere? Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't quite what, know what you mean by Ying body. And as for the question on me, let me save that because I don't have that much time. Um, but that's another big topic around vegetarianism. Another question. For death, is DRB invited to attend the funeral services for those who died? Um, actually, no. In, in DRBA, Master Hua actually kind of set up guidelines for our monastics not to go to funeral services. But we could have memorial services in the monastery itself. Um, the reason we, we saw that in the, the last session where um, Great Master, I think, Hong Yi talked about how um, the we shouldn't put our energy in trying to have monks do elaborate ceremonies on behalf of the deceased. What's the most important thing to do is to recite sincerely. So what we do have is an Amitabha recitation group that's led by lay people. And then when they go out to recite for those who are deceased, they take no money. They just go and sincerely recite. And, um, and that's kind of the principle. And for those who have an affinity with the monastery, they come and ask the monastery, would it be all right if we did a memorial service for them in the monastery? And everybody can come to the monastery. We put up a pie away for the person and we transfer merit to that person's um, good rebirth. What kind of benefits when we transfer the merit to the deceased? Does it violate the dependent origination law? That's another question. Um, what I'm assuming you're saying is when we transfer merit, is that uh, go against karma, which says that we're heir to our own actions and that um, if somebody else gives us something, then somehow we're getting a benefit that wasn't our own actions. Maybe I just have a quick response. I mean, this we can go into much more deeply. In the Earth Store Sutra, it actually says that of the practices that we do, one seventh of it goes to the person who's deceased six sevenths of it still stays with us, which is interesting They use mathematics. But I think the principle is that what you're saying is that what we do in our own lives uh, has the biggest difference. So rather than waiting for some, our family members to help us when we die, the most important thing is for us right now to start practicing, to develop the, you could say good karmic, uh, good karma, so that when the time comes for us to die, we have the blessings to go a good place. Um, there's more to that, um, but maybe we can explore that later. Can DRB attend funeral for loved ones? I'm ready to answer that. Saw the TV show about Would you upload today's recording to Google Drive? Yes, I've been uploading all of these talks to Google Drive. And the last one is about monastics attend funerals for loved ones in public. So I already also answered that one. Okay, so this is our last session on uh, death and dying and the process of rebirth. I'm thinking about the next session to do it on the matrix. So somebody asked the matrix and a lot of more people had questions about it and feedback on it. And I thought it might be interesting to, to explain the Buddha Dharma through the movie, The Matrix. It has such a deep influence on the modern psyche. And for those who haven't watched The Matrix, I also unpacked that movie itself as well. Um, however, if you have people have other ideas, please email that one I have on the screen. Um, that would be appreciated. I, I'm trying my best to respond to emails that come in. It takes me a couple of days, given everything that's going on. Um, but if it's a sincere question, I try my best to give a sincere answer. And also, as a note, the answers that I give aren't the final definitive answer. It's what I would say uh, a starting place for discussion. And the Dharma is therefore reflection and investigation. 
It's not there to be dogmatic. So I'm trying to just share what I've discovered, but it's not to be the final say. Okay, so um, if people want the link to the, to, let me give you the link for the actual, all the talks I've been uploading are here. Oops, sorry, I sent to everybody. Okay, so let's do the dedication of merit. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds away to grain compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Three bows. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Okay, so hope to see everyone next week where we'll investigate the matrix and what's reality. Okay, Amitofo.